Uh, I'm, I'm uh, Dan Schiffer, I'm the director of public programs and the writer of residence here. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Steve Zimmerstein from Stanford to talk about the idea of difficult books. Uh, in a minute I will introduce him formally, but just a couple of words before we start. The prompting for this conversation, as many of you probably know, is our exhibition, uh, Our Struggle, responding to Mein Kampf, which is in the Swiss Dinner Family Gallery. This is an extraordinary exhibition where uh, a French artist, Linda Elliott, um, was overwhelmed the first time she found herself in possession of a French copy of Mein Kampf. She didn't know what to do with it. She went through all kinds of reflections, and what she finally did is what you see in the gallery. She artistically transformed, or gave it to others to artistically transform this book. Um, it's a very interesting choice, um, and the question that um, I think it leaves us with, and I believe it's a question that's right at the front of the gallery when you walk in, is what does one do with such a book? And when I thought about that question, there's only really one person that I can think of who could hazard a guess, and that is our guest for tonight, Professor Zipperstein. Mr. Zipperstein is the Coxon Professor in Jewish Culture and History at Stanford University. He is the author of many award-winning books, including The Jews of Odessa, The Lucid Prophet, Hot Ma'am, and The Origins of Zionism, and most recently, Rosenfeld's Lives, Rosenfeld's Lives Fame, Oblivion, and the Furies of Writing. Um, the format for tonight will be the following. Professor Zipperstein will talk for a bit about some of the issues having to do with responses to books like Mein Kampf, Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and others. And then he and I will kind of unpack those ideas, try to connect it a little more to the exhibition, and talk about what some of these ideas mean in uh, a digital age when information, including really kind of putrid political stuff, can um, explode virally on the internet. So some history, some discussion about art, questions about how these things move forward in a digital age. Um, and after we have a chance to talk a little bit, um, I hope you'll ask some questions and participate in our conversation. Uh, final housekeeping note, please turn off your cell phones. And thank you for coming inside when there's fantastic dancing outside. Um, and probably they'll still be dancing when you come out. So please welcome Steve Zerberstein. was a bit amused when I saw the scene outside and uh, having a, a bit of bookish high school student who always sat out dances to imagine myself as a middle-aged man not only not dancing but talking about Hitler <laughs> <laughs> seemed as Freud uh, preferred to say overdetermined. Um, um, let, let me begin with a, um, an, a sort of encounter um, and then I'll, I'll explain how I'm going to structure these brief remarks. Um, a, a few years ago, I was, um, I was giving a series of lectures in, in Paris. I was there for five or six weeks. And um, at my, in my first visit to an English language bookstore, um, Village Voice, um, I, I trust it hasn't gone the way of so many great independent bookstores, um, I, uh, I, I met this um, uh, one of the employees, um, clearly interested in the fact that I wrote that I write Jewish history. And as I was looking for some books, I remember on the second floor, he walked over to me, and in a kind of mock, secretive way, he had a, I, I taught in England for a long time, but I know something about the use of, of accents in England, and his was a rather, uh, it was a North um, um, English accent inflected by some years in either Oxford or Cambridge. He walked over to me, whispered, and said, um, I collect dirty books. Now, what he, um, what, and, and he meant for me to be shocked, and, um, and he meant for me to sort of sense that he was like a character, say, out of, out of um, one of Le Carre's um, you know, novels, the sort of person who, who sort of, you know, who, who, who handles that, that tortured spy. Uh, but what he, he meant wasn't um, um, the, the obvious thing. What he meant was that he collected anti-Semitica. Anti uh, he was a close to Leon Poliakov, who was a, um, a, 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 who had produced a, a really copious history of anti-Semitism, I think had arranged for the dispensation of Leon Polikov's papers after his, his, his death. And, um, and, um, and he, he, he understood, of course, that what he collected was dirty. Now, what we'll wrestle with 
over the next hour or so is what one does with such dirty books. I'll, I'll speak with you about three of the more influential written um, from the late 19th century to the present very briefly. Um, then I'll raise some questions about how one um, 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 lives in a world with such literature without feeling engulfed. And then um, I'll um, raise some questions about the presumptions, as I see it implicit in the exhibit across the hall, that there's something intrinsically dangerous about the existence of um, books like Mein Kampf, a questionable assumption, I think. Um, um, that's someone mine. has started drinking my water, but it's not, it's not mine. I'm not possessive about water. And, uh, and, um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll open for discussion. Okay. So uh, I'm going to speak about, uh, briefly about three, three books. Um, um, the Foundations of the 19th Century by, uh, by Chamberlain, published in 1899, one of the great bestsellers in the first decade of the 20th century, sold some 100,000 copies, was lauded by Albert Schweitzer, uh, was one of the favorite um, uh, books of um, the German Kaiser Wilhelm, and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and when read today, just seems uh, a dangling mass of, of, of bias. Um, uh, we'll talk about a little bit about the foundations of the 19th century. We'll then talk about the protocols of the elders of Zion. I can't name the author because we don't know the author, but I'll talk about who the author might be according to recent scholarship. And this is the one uh, part of the talk that I can speak about with a, a, a degree of first-hand knowledge because some of the work that I'll be summarizing very quickly is work that I've done on it. And then lastly, we'll turn, of course, to my comp, which contrary to what you might assume, was um, f for the first 10 years or so of his publication, the least popular of, 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 um, of either of the three, of any of the three. And um, so um, let, let's start with the um, uh, foundations of the 19th century. Um, Stuart Houston Chamberlain was Oxford educated, um, graduated, I think, with a gentleman's um, third, which is like a kind of just obligatory C, was not a very good good student, um, uh, rather directionless, caught in a loveless marriage. Later, after the success of the foundations of the 19th century, he married one of Wagner's daughters. Um, um, and um, he's contacted in 1896 by a Munich publisher and, and asked um, to write a book summing up the history of all of humanity now that humanity was at the cusp of a, uh, uh, of a new, new, new century. He was someone who deeply believed, as did others in and around Wagner's circle, as did Wagner himself, that all of, of, all of human history culminated with Wagner. And um, um, imagine the load up one's shoulders. And um, <laughs> um, no, he admitted to Wagner's widow he knew nothing about history. Uh, but he actually sat, locked himself away for six months, writing eight hours a day, um, um, wrote some 1,200 pages. Um, um, about a third of the book covers the first 1,800 years of humanity as he understands it, and the next two thirds of uh, the, the 19th century. Um, um, and the two aims of the book, and I'll just read you some very, very short excerpts for you to get a sense of its flavor, are first to prove that all of humanity is divided into distinct races, and that the struggles between them constitute a key to understanding all human development. And secondly, each epic basically belongs to a different race. Um, and it's race, he argues, that holds all of humanity together, that defines basically what, what is most human. The Teutonic race, the Germans, um, are the race that will hold the future of humanity um, 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 uh, together. And as he explained historically, there were six influences that shaped the entire world. First, Greek art, Roman politics, the revelation of Christ, who by, by, by the way was not a Semite. There were Indo-European people in the region where Christ was, was born, so consequently absolves him of any connection with um, the um, the um, um, dusty uh, Semites. 
Um, and um, uh, there's other things that happen afterwards. Oh, the, the racial chaos that results from the disintegration of the Roman Empire and the destructive power of the Jews. And finally, hopefully, the redemptive mission of the Teutonic people. What a feature of Chamberlain's book, and this comes to be one of the tropes, one of the features of anti-Semitic literature up until the Second World War, or at least much anti-Semitic literature, is the notion that um, uh, we're in the 11th hour. The Jews have all but taken control. There's still a chance. There's still a chance to redeem um, humanity, but it has to be done now. It's a literature, as one historian uh, of, of, of uh, one, one historian of this phenomenon has described, as a literature of cultural despair, um, where not all is lost, but it's nearly lost. Um, and um, now, uh, he insisted repeatedly there was nothing crudely anti-Semitic about the book. He dedicated it to a Jewish teacher, the rector of the University of, of Vienna. The story of anti-Semitica is enormously complicated and far, far less linear than one would assume. I just want to read you two um, excerpts um, um, from it, just to give you a, a taste of it. Um, um, here. Out of the midst of the chaos towers, like a sharply defined rock amid the formless ocean, one single people, a numerically insignificant people, the Jews, this one race, has established as its guiding principle the purity of blood. It alone possesses, therefore, physiognomy and character. If we contemplate the southern and eastern centers of culture in the world empire and its downfall, and let no sympathies or antipathies pervert our judgment, we must confess that the Jews were, at that time, the only people deserving respect. And he concludes at least this section. Are we, are we for that reason to revile the Jews? That would be ignoble as it is unworthy and senseless. The Jews deserve admiration, for they have reacted with absolute consistency according to the logic and truth of their own individuality. What the Jews have done, according to Chamberlain, and the reason why they've, they've, uh, they've, they've, they've managed to succeed so well, succeed so well um, 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 economically, um, and in so many other uh, spheres, and Jews are, as a singularly literate group, highly visible in certain sectors of European society by the late 19th century. The reason why they've succeeded so well is a double-pronged strategy. First of all, they've maintained purity of race, which is the key to all um, social mobility. But secondly, what they've managed to do is to basically, uh, the term in Hebrew is noshrim, those kind of the, 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 the litter of the lot. They basically send off to intermarry with, 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 with non-Jews, and, and consequently, the litter of the lot doesn't pollute Jewry, but it pollutes other people. So they maintain absolute purity, and, um, and they manage to uh, pollute others with significant. And what's really significant about this literature is its, its resonance. Not only is Albert Schweitzer a great admirer of, 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 of Chamberlain, um, uh, up until the time of Chamberlain's, Chamberlain's death, uh, but he gets rave reviews, rave reviews in Times of London and, um, and, and, and elsewhere at, at a time when, when anti-Semitica actually could, could yield such, um, such reviews. Let's turn to the rather more mysterious text, The Protocols of the Elders of, of Zion. Now, um, part of the problem with talking about the protocols is that we, to this date, have no real idea of how they come about. What are the protocols? The protocols actually are published in various versions, uh, beginning in some respects in the 1890s, but really in their, what begins to be their sort of entirety, uh, uh, beginning in 1903, 1904. Um, but they really only catch on after the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, and um, um, the, the, the protocols um, in, in the various editions that say they run about 200 pages or so, but they, um, in their most popular um, uh, permutations, they're actually um, um, three or four or five pages at length uh, because, you, because they're so stupendously repetitive. And this is one of the features of anti-Semitic literature. It's enormously influential as it has been. It's, it's unbelievably repetitive. It's, it's, it's almost staggeringly boring. 
And, um, and so the, the, you, you can get a sense of what the protocols are about in three or four pages. And it was by and large in this way that they were distributed, mostly in the wake of the Russian Revolution, where Jews, or at least some Jews, Trotsky especially, um, is especially prominent. It seems as if the Jews are indeed taking over the world. And in especially circles fighting the Bolsheviks, the so-called white armies, um, three or four page excerpts from the protocols were distributed widely distributed to um, white army um, uh, uh, troops. The white army was a curious army because it was made up of uh, basically more officers than, than soldiers. Um, everyone wanted, there were a lot of aristocrats who all were officers. And, um, but um, but uh, and, and, and this, this gave the protocols life. What, what are the protocols? The protocols supposedly are, well, uh, protocols. Protocols of meetings. Um, held by um, the elders of Jewry, um, some claim in a cemetery in Krakow, some claim in the cemetery in, in Prague. Uh, apparently, the elders prefer cemeteries. Um, um, and uh, periodically, sometimes Switzerland, Switzerland sometimes. And, um, and, uh, and, um, and the, 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 the protocols presumably are transcripts of the meetings where the elder of the Jews explains his strategy. And what is his strategy? His strategy is to basically pollute the world with freedom. Uh, by, in other words, to encourage sexual freedom, encourage democracy, encourage all of those tendencies that tear down the fabric of real, real, real solid society that destroy the aristocracy, destroy the class system that characterized and maintained stability in, 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 in the Middle Ages, in the good old times. And, um, and, um, and then races will mix and workers will, 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 will begin to strike and, and, and capitalists will begin to oppress. And, 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 and the elder of the Jews doesn't mind, the elder of the Jews is responsible for fermenting attacks against Jews and admits this because these two will, will, will foment um, um, dissatisfaction among people. And finally, finally, in the midst of chaos, people will look for a leader. And this elder, a person who seems to have risen above politics, who uh, uh, someone who is, is blameless, um, 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 will simply come to the fore and, um, and will claim um, 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 his, 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 his place as ultimately the ruler of the universe and reestablish a Davidic, Davidic, Davidic kingdom. The, um, now all this sounds like bizarre nonsense, um, of, of course, but um, in the wake of the um, um, confounding devastation uh, that follows especially the Bolshevik Revolution, where the Bolsheviks the Bolsheviks basically in 1917 is comparable in the minds of many to say um, um, some, some, some group that sits in a, uh, at a table on Telegraph um, um, in Berkeley taking over the country with the largest landmass in, 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 in all of Europe. And so it's confounding. It's assumed that Lenin's going to fall. Lenin is barely, barely known. And, um, and so the intelligent, reasonable people try to cast about for some kind of explanation. And indeed, in um, 1920, uh, once the uh, protocols begin to gain some currency, the Times of London actually publishes an editorial saying, well, maybe this is the explanation. Maybe this is the explanation of what actually led us into the chaos of the First World War, where a roundly disliked Archduke's assassination, I mean, his uncle, the, um, the Emperor of Austria-Hungary, doesn't even attend his funeral, that his assassination throws the world ostensibly into this conflagration. Perhaps this explains it. It, it was then demonstrated um, that um, uh, about 50%, maybe 60%, of, of the text of the protocols was copied word for word from a, um, a, a, a French volume published in 1863 attacking Napoleon III. And, um, and the plagiarists didn't even sort of tweak out all of the French allusions. And, and, um, and, so, and so in subsequent editions um, uh, of, 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 of the protocols, the French edition has been printed side by side 
with the um, with the protocols themselves to demonstrate that the the text is impure. Uh, defenders of the veracity of the protocols have suggested have insisted that well the the anti Napoleon anti Napoleon the third polemicist Joly was mortified Joly or Moses Joly and he was Jewish and he anticipated protocols. I mean you, you can't prove some people wrong, but um, um, the, uh, uh, the the protocols themselves they seem to originate in a absolutely fascinating way, and I, I can only barely scratch the surface, but they, um, it seems as if the first version, by general consensus among scholars, and this is, this is, this is something that we've only come to fairly recently, um, was probably written by, um, there was, there's a category of, of communal intellectual figures in late imperial Russia who were called honest anti-Semites. You could kind of travel in society, and you you may you might even go to a dinner with them. Um, um, Chaim Weizmann, the first who later becomes the first president of the state of Israel, talks in his memoirs about how he's on a train with one of these honest anti-Semites, and um, and um, the man tells him what he does, and the answer is Chaim Weizmann, who's traveling around the Russian Empire collecting. Uh, trying to whip up support for the Zionists. And he, as High Weizmann actually doesn't, doesn't tell us in his memoirs, he t tells us after he was established by his own movement and thrown out of the presidency in the 1930s. That, that's when he tells it. And he, so, he, so he says, uh, he sort of got in the same train compartment and asked him, well, what do you do? And High Weizmann tells him, and the anti Semite looks at him sternly and says, be careful, they'll eat you up. <laughs> as, as, I, as I might have knew well. Um, um, in, in any event, it, it seems as if the, the story of the origin of the protocols is actually enormously interesting. They're, the first version is probably written by a man named Kushiban, um, not a household name to be sure, but, um, but in late imperial Russia, a person of, of some standing who, who wrote among other things, the main guidebook for, for, for the province of, for, for Bessarabia. And uh, a very nice um, book and very straightforward Russian that just periodically there's a sentence talking about avaricious, rapacious Jews, and then he goes back to the fauna and flora. And, um, and um, it, it, it's, uh, and Khrushchevon, curiously, the, um, he, he actually is one of the figures who it seems is responsible for fomenting the uh, an attack on Jews in the uh, dusty south um, western city of Kishinev in 1903, and that actually um, um, sends shockwaves throughout um, 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 much of the Western world. There's no persecution of Jews that um, ever gets the kind of resonance of the Kishinev pogrom, and um, and um, and that experience actually encourages, it seems, in Khrushchev the belief that Jews are uncannily influential. Well, it turns out that the, just by sheer chance, there's this doctor who runs the local Zionist office, who ran it for years in Kishinev, a man named Bernstein Cohen, who, who can, can barely earn a living. We know that he, I mean, doctors, the AMA managed to bolster him. Salaries of doctors in the 20th century. To be a doctor in Europe does not mean you have a great deal of money. Uh, and Bernstein Cohen is even less than most. But he, he's, he's running the, this, this Zionist Correspondence um, Bureau, so called. He has some cash. He's a person of some industry and has some contacts abroad. He's actually, he's actually something of a, of, a, of, a, of a kind of Luftmensch. But he manages to get his way to the border. Um, of, of New Romania to Yasi and to send out telegrams. And we actually have um, copies of some of the telegrams that he sends and, um, and alerts the world immediately about this, this pogrom, which then reinforces Khrushchev's notion that Jews are uncannily influential, where in fact Bernstein Cohen is just unusually lucky <laughs> in being able to have some cash at hand. We, we, know, we know the telegraph office he goes to. I've actually calculated the cost per telegram of what he sends, and telegrams were fairly, fairly cheap then, and it was just as is so often in history a matter of sheer mundane circumstance that, um, that he manages to make the Kishinev pogrom into the world important event that it is. But Khrushchev watching this actually is stunned and it, it seems to deepen his sense of the, um, of the extraordinarily manipulative power of, of Jews. And he then goes off and a few months later he writes the first version it seems of the protocols of the elders of, 
of, of Zion to the extent to which we could now reconstruct how and why it came about. Um, and finally, some words about um, Mein Kampf. Um, for those of you who haven't read it recently, um, <laughs> quote, the Jew is a maggot in a rotting corpse. He is a plague worse than the Black Death of former times, a germ carrier of the worst sort, mankind's eternal germ of disunion, the drone which insinuates its way into the rest of mankind, the spider that slowly sucks the people's blood out of its pores, the pack of rats fighting bloodily among themselves, the people's vampire. <clears throat> Hitler's life philosophy was, according to most of his biographers, fashioned by the flophouse. Here, where he spent his formative years dressed in rags so worn that he was nearly thrown out of more than one hostel because administrators feared that his pants would simply disintegrate. Um, in such flop houses, 50 men slept in one room, and some who, 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 who frequented them testified as to how they would force themselves to spend three or four nights um, um, awake in order to tolerate the stench and horror of these collective sleeping places. Here, Hitler learned, as he states in Mein Kampf, quote, the idea of struggle is as old as life itself. For life is only preserved because other living things perish through struggle. In this struggle, the stronger, the more able, um, a win, while the less able, the weak, lose. Struggle is the father of all things. It is not by the principle of humanity that man lives or is able to preserve himself above the animal world, but solely by means of the most brutal struggle. If you do not fight for life, then life, then life will not be, never be won. There's three themes to my conflict. First, the importance of living space for Germany. It has the need to expand into Russia once France is neutralized. Secondly, that the Aryans are the only creative force in the world. They have accomplished this by trampling on, on, on others, but, and here's the third thing, in modern times, rightfully subjugated people, Slavs, Jews, um, have risen themselves to the level of the rightful conquerors, and concomitantly, the Aryans have begun to sacrifice their purity of blood. Racial mixture um, is the cause of lessened creativity. Blood mixture is the sole cause of the decline of old and venerable civilizations. Hitler was massively interested in the reasons for the decline of, of Rome. And the real culprit for this, um, in past and present, is the Jew. As he stated in 1939, quote, if the international Jewish financiers inside and outside Europe should again succeed in plunging the nations into another world war, then the result will not be the Bolshevization of the world and the victory for Jewry, but the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. What, what, um, what does one do with this stuff? And, and, and the, the question, I think, is not only pertinent for Jews, uh, but perhaps especially pertinent for Jews insofar as it's so easy to be overwhelmed by this for one to see this and only and, and almost only this alone. And it's, it's uh, I'll tell you, I, I've never actually given quite this talk and did so because of my affection for Dan uh, and the Contemporary Jewish Museum. But I'll tell you that in, in lecturing to general audiences, and especially to Jewish audiences, there's nothing that gets audiences as upset at you as, as, as when you remind them that they will almost certainly die in their own beds. In other words, that, um, that they will live out their lives peacefully. Um, that, um, that Jewish history in America and in many other places in the world, in past and in present, is not, cannot be reduced simply to a history of persecution. There is nothing, there's nothing that gets Jewish audiences typically as upset as you. And it's exactly at this point in the lecture that you begin to be disliked or distrusted. In other words, you've listened to me up until now, 20 minutes, I sound like a reasonably bright guy, I'm well informed, but suddenly I turn into some raving dogmatist. And, um, and there, there is a, an inverse relationship uh, between the books that tend to be embraced most emphatically as explaining to general readers 
what it is the Jewish past was, Daniel Goldhagen's uh, book on the Second World War, which was roundly criticized by the historical profession, and for, 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 good, for good reason, and those books that tend to be most respected by us. Um, it's, it's almost as if one's, one's looking, looking at the same phenomena through, 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 through drastically different eyes. And so the first challenge, it seems to me, um, 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 that uh, this body of literature, this, this reality that, um, that in modernity, some of the most influential, popular, best-selling books were books filled, defined, by putrid hatred for Jews. That's simply a reality, a reality cannot, one cannot wish away. And at the same time, how one lives with that reality without reducing all of, of Jewish history and all of modernity to that reality, I think is, um, is, is, is a real challenge. It's, 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 it's comparable to the challenge of, of anyone trying to live a stable life of seeing, seeing things with stability as opposed to seeing things in, a, in, a, in, a, in an off-kilter way. One, one recent example of, 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 of a rather off-kilter way of, of seeing such things, and, and I, I just want to try to concretize what it is I'm saying as clearly as, as possible in the local Jewish newspaper about three weeks ago, a couple of local foundations um, ran a full-page um, um, ad uh, with a brief essay by former New York Mayor Ed Koch um, that compared uh, Obama's Middle East policies to Hitler's World War II policies, mm -hmm. and um, and um, and um, and suggested and stated that that um, American Jews were unwilling to speak out. Koch said during the Second World War, but now they must actually learn from that um, sordid sordid past and must speak out now. Obama's policies, Obama's Middle East policies, are and should be the subject for, for debate. My guess is that they're the subject of debate within his own within his own cabinet. But um, but um, there 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 is a universe <laughs> separating the, um, the, the 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 policies of the current standing uh, president um, from those pursued. By, uh, by, by Adolf Hitler, why it is this, it's this example that immediately comes to mind. Uh, um, it comes to mind in the minds of, of, of otherwise, one would assume, sensible people. I mean, Ed Koch, I uh, suspect, hasn't always been sensible, but I'm, I'm sure that I mean, he did make some sensible decisions in his, 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 in, in his lifetime. Why it is that that example comes to mind is something that ought to puzzle that, that we ought to be preoccupied with. And, and finally, um, the, if I didn't mis, misunderstand the thrust of that extraordinary collection um, uh, exhibit, uh, there was the suggestion that it's rather astonishing that this book, that my Kampf continues to be um, published, actually by Hugh Mifflin, my 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 current publisher of the book I already am too, but um, um, they presumably you say they've been punished, but they've been bought like every other publisher has been bought and swallowed by hardcore and they're in terrible shape and they'll probably implode. But in any event, um, um, the um, 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 there, there's something fundamentally questionable about the the very decision in an all too free America to have this book in print. Now, as it happens, Mein Kampf today does not have the kind of currency of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Uh, at last, when I last counted, there were 1,500 separate websites um, devoted to the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, um, hundreds of them in the Arab world. Um, um, the, the, the part of the power of the, of the Protocols is that um, the, the, the narrator has the sound of someone on talk radio. Uh, it's, it's voice. It's um, uh, if you, it, 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 after this lecture tonight, if you're inspired to reread my comp, you, you'll see one of the 
you'll immediately see why it actually has disappointing sales um, in its first decade or so of its lifetime before Hitler becomes Hitler and everyone buys it in, in much the same way that they buy the Bible in, 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 in Germany. But um, there, there is something um, eerily arresting about that voice in, um, in the protocols and, and eerily contemporary, given the prevalence of talk radio today, not to conflate um, uh, uh, um, even the most hideous figure in talk radio with, um, with, with, with the voice in the protocols. But there is something, some, something not, not vastly dissimilar. Um, the, what I would argue, and, 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 and it's after making this case that I'll, 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 I'll start my, my conversation with Dan, is that um, um, one treats a, a, a work like my Kampf or the Protocols in a free society like ours um, by allowing it to be freely distributed. However, um, one of the, um, the, part of the underbelly of free society it's, is often its incapacity to fight for its own survival. So there's a logic, it seems to me, and I'm not uh, a, a legal historian, that's not what I do, but in, in thinking about the issue that was posed to me uh, for this lecture, it seems to me not unreasonable to suggest the following, that um, liberty is, is, is precious, and, um, and in, in a in a world that enjoys liberty, we enjoy a lot of things whirling around us that we consider to be noisome, and that we do not restrict, because the, the prospect of restricting them basically restricts, restricts, restricts our lives in ways that are dangerous. But we do not permit those forces to uh, become so powerful as to destroy the very liberty that one wishes to protect. And that's where, of course, that's often liberalism's Achilles heel. In other words, where, how you draw the line, where you recognize that forces have become so dangerous and inimical to your society that they have to be quashed. It's very easy to decide to quash. Uh, it's very hard to recognize the crucial interplay between the necessity of liberty and the necessity of those inhibitions that only need to be put in place once liberty is threatened. So one could understand, given the heavy legacy of Mein Kampf um, and, 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 uh, and, and Hitler not only commands the German electorate, but is adored by, uh, by all but the fewest number of Germans uh, within two or three or four years of his um, election as chancellor in 1933, um, one can understand how in such a place one might have um, um, uh, laws uh, restricting the distribution of this book. And one could also understand why in a place like this, where not Madoff, not um, oil crises, not all kinds of issues have actually had any discernible impacts on a, on a rise in anti-Semitic sentiment, um, we could assume, not we, we mustn't assume simply that America is different, because that term suggests that all the rest of the world is a block, and that America is, is, is different. It's like that, the way in which Israel sometimes is described as people arguing you don't want it to be a state like all other states, as if all other states are the same, as if Belgium and China are the same, wherever Gentiles are, they're the same, and then there's the Jewish state. It's, I wouldn't see it in that sort of formulation, but in other words, that one actually looks squarely, honestly, at the place in which one lives in, and, um, and takes it in as fully as possible. And that isn't deluding oneself. Not doing that is deluding oneself. That's all I have to do. So I kept to my time frame, more or less. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry that I have nothing to work with. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Um, thank you. Um, 
So I, uh, I'm going to start in a place that I wasn't necessarily expecting to start, but just thinking about the issue of um, who reads Mein Kampf, Mein Kampf, who should be allowed to read it, who prints it, who should be allowed to print it. The, the copyright for Mein Kampf is about to expire, uh, which is now owned, I believe, by the, the uh, state of Bavaria. And there's all kinds of questions, uh, including kind of disagreements within the Jewish community, whether Mein Kampf should be allowed to be printed and distributed in Europe, which now is not allowed to in most a lot of European countries. It's not, so um, certainly in Germany and, and, uh, and France. So I don't know. I, I, do, you, do you have strong feelings about this issue of, of, um, of the future of kind of the publishing issues related to Mein Kampf? Yeah, I mean, I, I think along the lines of what I was trying to suggest a moment ago, um, I would think in, um, you know, it's a hard thing to argue that you only give opponents of liberty voice as long as they can't have any political imprints. And um, it seems manipulative. Um, and yet, if one treasures liberty, however defined, then that isn't being manipulative, that's being sensible. And um, so, um, arguably, um, the Bolsheviks themselves should have been more resolutely um, um, fought than they were um, um, by those who sensed quite clearly what it is they, they were. And so, um, I think it's a question, it's almost a question of a place-by-place -place judgment. And so um, I think in societies where anti-Semitism is a significant force, and unfortunately much of what we call anti-Semitism today is pretty much a um, export from um, that conflict that, that's called the conflict, as if there's, there's only one conflict in the Middle East, but, um, but the, um, it's mostly uh, an export of that conflict now, um, that conflict is born out of real political contestation. And um, it seems to me facile to assume that anyone who opposes Israel in that conflict is ipso facto an anti-Semite. Uh, that's absurd. Israel makes political decisions like any state. Some decisions are good, some decisions are bad, some governments one likes, some governments one doesn't. It's perfectly legitimate to weigh in on that political process. But certainly, um, um, animus toward Israel in, 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 in significant circles is, I think it's fair to say, vastly disproportionate to Israel's sins. And so um, one would judge whether Mein Kampf might have a um, more toxic impact. You know, you, it's, um, it's, it's really not a very good book. I, I, I have, happen to, to, to wake up I read it years ago and I felt I, I never teach anything unless it's fresh in my mind and I just the idea of getting it fresh in my mind seemed a little bit noisome and I ended up waking up quite early this morning and decided to just read it from the beginning until for as long as I could, could read it. I read about two, three hundred pages and um, it's, um, if you remember for those of you who sure intimately acquainted with it. It's, uh, it, it, um, it, it begins as a kind of, um, it, it, it actually initially wanted to call it um, settling my, my, my scores or something. It, he's, he's, he's trying to establish himself above all the other racists as the uber race, <laughs> racist. And he, and he kind of erases them from, from this, 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 this text. And it's, 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 it's a life story. Um, um, not all that, not artfully told, and then apparently he was actually chastened by his comrades and, and asked to actually write a more coherent book. And so it's actually, Mein Kampf is made out of two books. It's, um, there's the first book that's a kind of autobiographical, rambling thing that Jews appear in and around page, in the German edition, around page 35, 40 for the first time, and they certainly uh, come to occupy a prominent role. And then the, the second book of Mein Kampf um, is a more programmatic book, but this is stupendously turgid stuff. So now, turgid anti-Semitic that can be intellectual. I, I I appreciate that. I think I would judge it by a um, country by country basis. I'm I'm not sure that I would give it lend it the kind of importance. Um, I um, that some might. Um, you know, it's um, 
you know, so much, it seems to me, of one's own, so, so much of what we do to maintain our own sense of self as individuals, so much of what societies do to maintain their own um, stability is born not only out of remembering, but forgetting. You know, if the Germans and French didn't forget, they'd still be fighting over us. us. And um, almost, um, almost all wars end with forgetting. We've, by and large, uh, Jews have by and large forgotten about the Germans. We haven't forgotten about the Poles. There's a, a outsized preoccupation with Poles, a, uh, a rather undersized preoccupation with, with Germans. I'm not suggesting that the decision is wrong or right, but there has been a certain degree of forgetfulness um, in, involved. We've completely forgotten about the complicity of the French, and the French have gotten off pretty much scot free. And um, so, um, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm criticizing that. You, you can't. I mean, we, we all know people who live their lives having never forgotten any slight. You know, and you don't want to sit at a Passover Seder with them. <laughs> I wonder if the, the, the France uh, connection might be a segue to talking a little bit more about the exhibition. Um, so I, I'm curious, if I could, how many people have been through the exhibition? Great. Can I ask another question? I've been asking this groups a lot since the exhibition opened. How many people have read Mein Kampf or read parts of Mein Kampf? A little bit, yeah. Uh, that's interesting. So uh, the, Linda Elliott, this French artist, um, when she got a hold of this copy, decided that she had to do something with this book. Um, and way of going back to one of the original questions framing this discussion, and she didn't um, she didn't put it away. She read a little bit of it. She didn't really read the whole thing. She she didn't destroy it. She engaged with it in some way. She tried to transform it. She wrote on it. She manipulated it in some way, um, and it's a, it's a very interesting response. It's kind of in the middle of all the options in a way, but clearly by engaging it, she is taking it seriously. Um, so, I don't know, I think about, you know, she's a Jewish artist. Is, is, that, is that a Jewish response? I mean, what, what, what do Jews do with books like this? Yeah. You probably can't, I don't think you can answer that uniformly, but this is what one Jew did with a book like this. Yeah, I mean, I, um, you know, I, I took, you know, the assignment seriously, and so seriously that I recognized that I couldn't answer your question. And, um, um, I, um, there's some midway point that Sorry? what some midway point that you want to achieve between taking in the reality um, not of his, not simply of such a book, but of its stupendous influence. The reality of its influence and the way in which it cannot constitute your full understanding of the past. And um, and um, I don't know if you remember that when um, uh, Menachem Begin, the Prime Minister of Israel during the Lebanon War, the first Lebanon War, issued some statements. I forget the context in which he issued this, where he talked about how um, uh, Arafat was hiding in a, bunk, in a bunker in Beirut at that time, and he was visualizing Arafat as, as Hitler, and he was and, and seeing himself as attacking Hitler. Now, it, it was such a bizarrely disproportionate response. I mean, with the Jewish state, you have the creation of the military of a military sort that would have made what happened in the Second World War inconceivable. And, and so much of what's created is created in the wake of the war. And so I'm not, one shouldn't suggest that Begin, who was singed profoundly by the Second World War, should forget about Hitler. But, um, I mean, he's the one with the bombs. And Arafat's the one with the bunker. So why this metaphor? Why, why that, that metaphor then and now? So, it's, it's, it, it's inconceivable to obliterate. It's um, stupendously unhealthy for it to envelop. And it's that line between um, um, healthy awareness and envelopment that um, I think is, um, is a crucial one to wrestle with. And it's, 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 it's that that I began to think about a little bit more um, clearly, perhaps after a pre-poster question.
maybe just open up for a minute. And that'd be great. Uh, the way I see it, I mean, the, the book and, and the covering on the book, it's not the book itself, it's what happened in the war. It's a symbol, symbol of whatever happened. The, you mentioned Ed Koch and what he said, that he was at, uh, comparing it to obviously horrible situations that occurred that people who know the history would say that's horrendous. And again, when Begin compared Arafat to, again, it's using the sort of archetypes of evil to make your point disproportionately, clearly, but making your point based upon that kind of archetype. And I, I don't see really any difference in any of those three things. You happen to mention all three. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, uh, the difference is, I mean, if what everyone thinks of President Obama I happen to my him, I understand some people don't. If, 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 uh, if, if only there was no difference between Hitler and Obama, um, the, the, the fate of, 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 of the last century would be different. And so, so if you ask for difference between the three, uh, I would begin, begin there. Uh, I, um, I, 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 I'm not denying that the catastrophic um, impact of the war could end up um, blinding um, those affected by it to um, the world that subsequently is created. I don't lack empathy for that, but one could employ empathy and at the same time recognize that something profoundly unhealthy is happening. We know with people around us, people we love, we can have the deepest empathy and at the same time feel that sometimes what they do, what they think, what they feel is unhealthy. The point I'm making, and maybe I didn't make it clearly enough to me, it's just another example of rhetoric. Rhetoric to the highest level of, you know, painting something with evil as whenever you're making your statement, to make it a grander statement, you know, something that people could relate to and maybe really get behind. I'm not making, whether any of those statements are true or false, that's not my point. The point is, all of it's rhetoric. I know, but that's, that's, well, I mean, if you excuse me, that's much the same argument that would be used to defend some of the, the very noxious literature that you recognize as noxious. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's a rhetorical excess. That's how Hitler's, Hitler's, uh, Mein Kampf was actually fairly well reviewed in America, too. Mm -hmm. And it was, and, and often that was said, he doesn't really mean that literally, he actually did mean that literally he wasn't planning to implement it. He couldn't quite imagine that he would do it, but clearly he was being recklessly um, canted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, I suppose, if, if we're raising questions, about whether certain books ought to breathe and live, ipso facto we're raising questions about a point at which rhetoric, as you put it, becomes so noxious that it ought not to exist in the public domain. That's the question at hand. Mm -hmm. So one can't simply say, gosh, it's just rhetoric, because we're asking whether some rhetoric is actually so intrinsically dangerous that people shouldn't hold it. One of the most interesting historical things that I realized in the course of the museum previous exhibition together is that Mein Kampf was a selection of the Book of the Month Club. I don't remember the year. Um, it was actually, um, it was um, uh, when it was uh, translated first into uh, English. It was actually a, a, a high level sl um, up selection. It was not just one of the Stom selections. <laughs> it was, yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah, which is you know, remarkable to think about. Yeah. I saw a couple other hands. Please. Well, we've been talking a lot about you know, the, the merits of the book, which are, which is almost ludicrous. <clears throat> the question seems to me is why, you know, the effect of the book, not because it was such a great piece of literature, but the effect of the book at the time that it occurred. Mein Kampf may be worth a, a cursory read for, for, um, to pick up some of the, you might say, from proletariat and, 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 and the mentality. It's interesting. Um, it seems that within our culture, there's a never again finding spirit, and there's and, and there's a trauma still in certain in certain areas. It, it's traumatic. Uh, and after 
40, 50 years or more, um, 60, where are we are now? Um, you know, a country says, you know, even though the UN recognized you 60 years ago and that you've been, you know, you know, playing a part or a thing, we don't recognize your existence. We don't even recognize your right. But the UN, the UN has not said that. Before. No, no, I didn't say that. I didn't say yeah, that. But, uh, what, what do you mean? No, I was saying I was I was giving you an idea. I was giving that it's not the book, but it's it's the sure. it's the scenery that's going on at the time. So if a if a gay Arab country says you know we won't even recognize you, you know rights of resistance. Having said that, there's a counter thing because I think either either knowingly by by extreme right wing they they almost keep up that that tension um, and. I think it's all, it, it, that's almost another kind of reaction. So I think it's when these books occurred and what was historically happening at the, uh, yeah. at, at, at the time, um, it was convenient uh, in between the wars. Uh, there was a runaway inflation in the early 20s in Germany, and then, of course, they were impacted by, by the Depression. And it looks like a lot of uncritical people <coughs> were uh, Quite willing, maybe probably didn't read it, but had heard things quoted. In yeah. the, no, there's there's a question of why sometimes. I mean, often you're right; it has little to do with the intrinsic qualities of the book, but it's it's resonance at the time. Sometimes I think there is something about the quality of hate literature that does make it stand apart, and I tried to make that point with regard to the protocols. I think that there's, there's there can. One can surmise why the protocols, far more so than the foundation of the 19th century, which, which was also a runaway bestseller, or Mein Kampf, why the protocols continues to have legs um, in so much of the world. And there, I think it has to do with some of the intrinsic qualities of the text. Uh, it's a hideous text, but, but some of the qualities that I pointed out. Um, um, but one does want to ask why in a Europe awash with hate literature, published beginning in the late 19th century and on, onward, why some works rise to the surface and why others sink. And um, yeah, in the case of my conflict, it's, it's clear, as has been pointed out, it rises with the rise of Hitler. And, um, and um, in the case of the protocols, it clearly has nothing to do with the, um, with the prominence of his author. And um, so sometimes it has to do with the text, and sometimes it doesn't have to do with the text. I think that's. So the protocols these days take over my company? Way, way, way more. Way more. <clears throat> my company is actually fairly obscure. As um, in the, uh, I mean, I'm not a, 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 an intimate expert in the circles that uh, per pervade hate literature, but, um, but um, um, uh, students of contemporary hate literature all. Um, argue that my conf is actually fairly obscure now. Not all that widely read, but the protocols are, are massively read. And the example um, I'm often hear about is the protocols being um, very influential in Japan. Uh, influential in Japan, there was a 10 part series, televised series in Egyptian television a few years, a few years ago, modeled in one way or another after the protocols. Um, protocols is uh, numerous um, um, recent editions of the protocols in various languages. I mentioned, I mentioned Japan. Uh, well, you, I interrupted you. So, so the, the, the protocols is that become the biggest bestseller now. Um, when people read them, they read them because they're curious, or they read them because they believe in what it says. Where yeah, is I, it? I think it, you know, it depends on where, but the, the protocols, I think, speak to a number of contemporary obsessions. First of all, that the world that one sees is not the real world that there are forces just behind the, the, um, the, um, the curtains that actually manipulate the world. Some call them Goldman Sachs, some call them Jews, but there's forces that really, we don't know what really goes on. And so the, the protocols, first and foremost, speak to that notion of, of how nothing that we see is really real, that everything that is real is, is hidden. Um, and, um, and then, um, I'm convinced it has to do with the way in which the protocols are a phenomenon that transcends, if you will, text. They're a transcript. They're talk. They're actually what is now contemporary. 
in a world where books are becoming less and less influential and where talk is the primary way in which ideas are spread. And, um, and uh, we hear that all around us, the astonishingly intimate conversations people engage in on cell phones in our presence. It's, it's embarrassing beyond belief, but it's just part of, part of the wallpaper in which we live our lives now. And so talk surrounds us. If there's a reason, I think, why talk radio is so influential. And eerily enough, though produced years ago in a completely different context, they have that quality. And, um, and then, of course, there's the, um, the argument that they, they're, they're not, they, they don't employ the same racialist, quasi-scientific categories that um, I, I, I showed you uh, that, that, that characterized the Chamberlain book or Mein Kampf. And so, you know, those kind of quasi-scientific categories are now passe. Um, they kind of talk past them. And so consequently, they're not, um, they don't have that leaden um, overlay. Those were three possibilities. Um, I want to maybe just introduce uh, one other subtopic and then continue to have a conversation which has to do with, you know, with the digital world and kind of, you know, what happens online. It seems to me that um, uh, information that is online is kind of biased towards the sound bit, towards emotion towards towards facts that can't be legally verifiable, towards things that um, have the propensity to spread virally. Um, it's very interesting. It's hard. It's um, uh, you know we've we've lost kind of a certain kind of liberal culture where we are expected and want to spend a lot of time with a book or with an argument. I'm rereading Daniel Deronda, and I think I'm you know, 80 pages in, and I, it's still the book still has several countries, and I mean it just. You know, we would never tolerate that today in terms of just wanting what we want right at that moment. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, with, uh, with that kind of digital landscape, um, how ideas and text like the protocols of the others of time would, would move. It seems like you're talking about these three to five page, I think that's kind of the equivalent of a YouTube video, I mean, just like this little snippet. It seems like that in a way, the internet could be an ideal breeding ground for kind of the you know, even the further proliferation of some of these ideas. You know, on the one hand, one could, on one hand, one could say, well, similar arguments have been made ever since the rise of mass literacy. You know, the yellow press, um, newspapers corrupting, um, literacy no longer belonging primarily to the kind of people who could slug through down in Toronto, and um, so, um, so one could respond somewhat blithely with a kind of egalitarian blandishment of your whatever worries underlying what you're saying and say, well, you know, this is the democratization of, of knowledge and of course one sees um, the ways in which um, now knowledge is accessible to, to people who don't have access to libraries, don't have, and you know, all those arguments and then there's the horrible underbelly and the way in which so much of the internet is a disgusting swamp, and, um, and the way in which it gives a voice to idiots, and and um, you know, and then there's the other argument. And again, in anticipating the discussion, and I'm not an expert on the internet, and I'm technologically um, um, inert, uh, really. Um, I um, I was trying to think of what I could say coherently about this because when I first um, agreed to do this and. I blithely said to Dan, well, gosh, we should certainly talk about the internet. And then I realized afterwards, I really have nothing coherent to say about the internet. I, I have other hopefully coherent things to, to say. And so, you know, you, you, feel, you feel as if, I mean, one feels this also in the world of publishing. And I'm, I'm close to um, a fair number of influential people in publishing. And they'll admit to you over scotch that they have absolutely no idea. What, what reading is going to look like in, in 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. leading, leading agents, leading publishers, lead, have absolutely no idea, maybe after two scotches. And, um, <laughs> and um, so, I don't know, I don't know. You know, on the one hand, to sort of excoriate it makes one sound like a Luddite, and to, um, and to, to insist that this is just another wrinkle in the history of literacy makes one sound Pollyannish. And so, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, there's certain moments in history where one recognizes one lives with anxieties and um, with a certain degree of abiding uncertainty. 
And um, I think this is one of our great uncertainties, you know, and um, the um, just just how it is, just the, the difference for the next generation of readers between acquiring information and acquiring wisdom. To what extent the technological things that we hold, and I'm the proud owner of an iPad and, and love it, but to what extent those kinds of technological ga gadgets provide access to information rather than to the kind of wisdom that um, is acquired from books or whether even making that statement marks one as hopelessly, you know, nostalgic and archaic. And so um, I'm not sure that one, I, I don't know that one can do more than put that on the table and look at all that on the table. You, you were going to, uh, if you have something angry to say to me, just feel free mm -hmm. or whatever. Are you looking at yeah, Yes, yes, yes. Right. <laughs> I'm just thinking that it's a revolution. I, I, I'm of a certain age with the gray hair, and I think it's a revolution. And we get, we have, uh, we did not want a computer, and we ended up having to have, and we feel we've got to have it. And there are things we want to go to the Academy of Science, and we call up, and you have to get a ticket and print it, and you can't, you know, we used to call up and make a reservation, da da da. So all these things, and we get a lot of terrible, we have received emails from uh, friends who said, you know, look what we got. I met somebody on an airplane from London, and she sent me some things that were very anti-cement. You said, look what I got, and we're sharing. And then we either send it, you know, do we send these things on to people? Sometimes we do. Sometimes it, you have to let people know about this and so that we're aware of it. Uh, it's from ACLU, it's from ADL, you know, and we're involved that way, but we're overwhelmed. And sometimes, you know, he, he's on, I say, you know, get off of this thing. And we're in a revolution. And I think you have made a very important point that we just really don't know where Absolutely. we're going with books. And the idea of the um, reading, I was interested with uh, Mein Kampf. I think, wasn't that uh, the book that they, the Skinhead in Idaho, was it? That there was a lot of, when that, yeah. the Skinheads, yeah. I think they were bringing that, that was what they were all reading. I, that was when I was became. Apparently, it, it is the book of chores among skinheads. Yeah. So there's, there's, you know, we don't. There's an element <clears throat> of people taking it to use. Right. And but I mean, but you know, in our society, skinheads are in public life utterly really marginal. In other yeah. in other societies, people with those sorts of views are not. So um, um, yeah. Yeah, it's good. Maybe two or three more comments if if they're about this topic, and then maybe we'll start to wrap up. I was just thinking, I mean, in terms of this discussion, it seems like to me that the internet kind of renders this discussion uh, pointless because there's really, whether you want this particular material of any kind to be available or not, it's just going to be, you, you know, all attempts to control the internet have been basically absurd so far and seems like that's just going to be the deal. So it's not a question of if you, if material's available anymore, it's, yeah, then it goes good. to a different discussion. And maybe that's always been the case, actually, because yeah. it's you know very hard to control. There's the presumption, I mean, maybe this presumption is archaic too, that the embossing of something into the form of a book with a thickness, with a thickness comparable to that of the Bible is an obscenity. And so that, on the one hand, you're absolutely right. Now, I mean, it's only horrible and repressive societies that actually restrict access to the internet. And free societies have free access to everything on the internet. You know, the wonderful stuff and the and the and the sewage. But those attempts usually yeah. fail as well. Yes, exactly. China. And, and it China fails. Yeah. Um, I think the there's this presumption and it's a presumption that certainly holds um, for my generation and perhaps not for yours, that somehow the creation of a book is something endows some kind of um, specialness, some kind of aura on an, 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 an artifact, and that that should not be endowed out to my comp. So I, mean, I think that's so. So the, the 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 argument could still have some teeth, presumably. Yeah. A couple a couple more yeah. comments, and then we're going to wrap up. One of the things I've been thinking about, and this is certainly true, when I'm seeing the exhibit which I have mixed feelings about the exhibit because I'm glad it's here in some ways and in other ways I kind of feel like it draws too much attention to that work. But my, what I've been thinking about is what do we do about education? What about, for instance, when uh, teenagers have world history? 
should, should there be, a, instead of ignoring the protocols and Mein Kampf and all of that, should there be a section where you, you have selected, you offered us a few that could certainly be the beginning of a lesson, a few lines, a few paragraphs that make some of their key points, and then you would explain and open it up. Why is this wrong? What do you think about this? And why should we not? Why is this propaganda? Why is this? Even if it's not dangerous the way it once was, it, those ideas in one form or another can still resonate, especially if you have an ignorant audience. So should we confront it in school and go after it and, and make a strong case as to why we're against it? I mean, I think there have been, there are all sorts of attempts to introduce the study of these kinds of texts into schools in this, in this area and elsewhere. Um, it's, I think, part of the problem, especially in the kind of milieu that we happily live in, a milieu that treasures um, relativism, mm -hmm. that recognizes, that insists that one can't insist on things being right or wrong, certain gender definitions, um, certain gender divisions, even allowing for the polymorphous nature of, of masculinity and femininity, it's so hard then to turn and say, you know what? There's no, rel there's, no there's nothing relative about this. This is sewerage, and this is simply wrong. And so um, it's it's very hard to switch. One knows that as a parent, um, and certainly one knows that. Um, I just, I've never taught high school, but I would presume one would, would one would encounter that dilemma in a high school high school classroom. And so I think what you're what you what you're suggesting is um, is certainly sensible. And at the same time, there's that, there's that, that tick. Yeah. You know? <laughs> time for one more question, please. I just wonder uh, if there are any books or publications on the market uh, which are written specifically to counter or critique the, the protocols of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess, and your wife suggests that we should get you more books, and we need, we need away from the internet. So, um, <laughs> so I, I, I should really suggest some titles. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the, the literature written, it's, it's, it's a kind of stodgy, um, kind of, the, the, there's one of the more influential books of the sort. It's a book written by a man named Curtis, who actually ended up being a rather distinguished Russian historian at Columbia. And, um, and in the, and he, and he, and he he has one of these side-by-side -side things with the protocols where he shows the French edition, he shows the protocols, and he just demonstrates it. It's, it's plagiarism, but the, um, it's a book written, gosh, I think before the, before the Second World War, but after the publication of, well, after the publication of Mein Kampf. And, um, and I remember in the foreword to the book, which was written by someone else, not Curtis, it, 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 it reminds the reader that Sheldon Curtis, the author, is of, of Yankee stock. In other words, he's not one of these semites who got off in the boat from from Sebastopol, <laughs> you know. And you can trust him; he's a he's a Yankee. Um, um, the um, um, probably the still the best single book on uh, the protocols is a book called Warrant, uh, Warrant for Genocide, which is a rather over the top title. The suggestion is that there's this linear connection between the protocols and the and the genocide of the Second World War. But it's uh, by a very good historian named Norman Kahn, C O H N. He probably gets completely wrong who wrote the protocols. And so, so sometimes historical work doesn't have to be entirely accurate to be, to be important. And um, so, um, of all the books in the English language, there's a much better one in French, uh, but uh, the, uh, all the books in the English language on the protocols, I would suggest. Uh, um, a warrant for genocide. Warrant, warrant for genocide. Warrant. Warrant. Uh, w -A -warrant. warrant for genocide. Because the suggestion is, is that this is the document that basically establishes the framework for genocide. Can you, can you, can you spell it? W a r r a n t. Warrant. 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 So oh, it's like a warrant for your arrest. Oh, warrant. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Warrants yeah. of genocide. Yeah. Warrant for genocide. Is that Curtis? Uh, colors. Uh, no, no. Oh. The, the Curtis book is, is just Picard. Um, uh, the the Con book is uh, is a better, okay. is a more interesting book. Oh, uh, I need to um, wrap up our discussion. And thank Professor Zerberstein for spending so much time with us and for his words. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.